April 2nd, 6 o'clock. Uh, Lisa, you take attendance. Uh, from from what I can see on my screen, all board members are present. Okay, I'm just going to say, uh, before we go to public comment, I'm just going to make an opening statement. So, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Education, we extend and hope for the speedy recovery of all members of our community who are sick. Now is the time when we are separated physically to stand together as a community and support the physical, emotional, mental, and educational needs of all of our people. There is no guidebook on how to navigate through a pandemic, except to reiterate what we do know. Stay home, stay safe, and be kind to one another. We are struggling to get through this the best we can. As Bloomfield Hill Schools, we remain focused on providing our students with the best education we can. You will soon see our continual learning plan 2.0 presented by our superintendent. A tremendous amount of work has gone into this plan and it will certainly evolve and change for the better as we implement. Please note that the plan is fluid and designed to be better through frequent feedback and flexible guidance. I wanna thank everyone who worked around the clock on this plan, along with many community members who provided best practices and feedback along the way. Governor Whitmer spoke this morning and issued an executive order closing all Michigan public and private schools for the remainder of the 2019-20 school year. In a minute, I will walk you through some of the specific mandates of her executive order. For those of you intending to watch our town hall at seven o'clock, we will be done presenting the Bloomfield Schools plan in time for that, and we will record the remainder of our meeting for those who wanna watch it later. If you'd like to make a public comment, please log into www.bloomfield.org slash comment and your comment will be read. Lastly, I want to acknowledge that school is much more than curriculum and classes. We sympathize with all the students and staff who will miss important milestones and recognitions and will be left with an, an, an inadequate closure for the year. For example, I spoke earlier today with Charlie Hollerith, our principal and the high school, our principal of the high school, who is currently going to be issuing a statement shortly regarding those events impacting our seniors at the high school. I also know that our administrators at the high school had a virtual call with some of our senior students to come up with a really innovative ideas on how to make this happen. Additionally, parent groups from across the district are brainstorming ways to safely celebrate all of our students and honor their time spent and accomplishments in a particular grade. We as the school board and administration will work with them to support safe alternatives to the transition. We all look forward to each spring. This is a difficult time and we each process and cope with it in our own way. Please be kind to each other and be kind to yourself. Together we will get through this. Okay, Dave, can, do you have, can you put up so I can read some of the uh, mandates from the executive order from this yes. morning? Yep, one second. Today, if you have not heard, Governor Whitmer signed executive order 2020-35 suspending in-person instruction for the remainder of the year. The 17 page document is available on the state's website and the below summarizes the key points of the executive order. Forgiveness of all snow days allowed under the law, six total, plus an additional 13 days related to the executive order closing schools. The 75% daily attendance requirement will be waived beginning March 11th for the remainder of the year. Districts will be required to create a continuality of learning plan on how they will deliver instruction and submit it for approval by learning to begin by April 28th, 2020. An application template will be available this week. The methods are not defined except that it can't be face-to-face. The plan must include a sub plan for high school seniors and graduation. There should be a process to certify that the students have completed the requirements of the Michigan merit curriculum. However, districts can determine how the credit is awarded. The goal is to have final grades on a transcript for graduating seniors. The district's plan should aim to support IEPs and 504 plans to the fullest extent possible, considering social distancing and the stay home, stay safe, save lives executive order. The SAT and PSAT will be offered in the fall for those students who missed out on taking it this spring. District will be required to continue to offer meals to eligible students and make sure staff is receiving compensation. District will be required to provide mental health services and continue to support ISD efforts to mobilize disaster relief child care centers. Students and families will not, students and families will, may not be penalized for an inability to participate in the continuality of the learning plan. The third grade reading law will not be enforced for the school year. Assessments will be suspended for the school year. The executive order provides a provision to ensure that MIPSER's service credit will not be impacted. 
a provision allowing and encouraging districts to donate PPE, cleaning supplies, and other materials to local organizations who need them is included in the executive order. The executive order allows districts to adopt a balanced calendar for the 2019-2020 school year or begin the 2020-2021 school year before Labor Day without seeking approval from the state. The executive order makes it clear that district families may be used by public school employees and contractors for the purpose of facilitating distance learning while also practicing social distancing in compliance with the Stay Home, Stay Safe, and CIA, CISA list. Hey, Dave, thank you very much. Um, Dave, can you put up uh, now, I'll put up and read public comment. At least the first portion of public comment. They will also be a public comment at the end of the meeting. So if you don't want to type something in now and wait till after uh, Pat Watson goes through our plan, feel free to enter it um, during the presentation. I will read it at the end of our meeting. Yeah, I have no public comments right now, but I see Jennifer asked if the link was working. So I will go check that. But yeah, we have no public comment at this moment. Okay. All right. So with that, I will hand it over to our superintendent, Pat Watson, who will go over our continuously learning 2.0 plan. So good evening and thank you. Um, excited to explain our continuous learning plan 2.0. And I'd like to begin by thanking all the teachers who put in countless hours to get this done, administrators, our learning service team, our IT team, and our Board of Education. So this truly was a team effort. I want to start by talking about the word hope. And on March 9th of 2020, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the word hope and what it means. That we're hopeful that COVID-19 doesn't spread throughout the United States. That we're hopeful that school will continue and we won't have to miss any days that we're hopeful that our students, our parents, community members, or people throughout this country don't get inflicted with this horrible, horrible disease. Hope kind of gives you that, that shiny moment. You, you hope for a good day. You, you hope for the sun to come out. You hope that things go your way. As great as hope is, there's one thing that hope isn't. Hope isn't a plan. And we realized on March 9th, 2020, that hope was not going to get us where we needed to be. And so we worked on two plans. <clears throat> the first plan we called At Home Learning 1.0. And based on guidance from the Michigan Department of Education, we rolled out review and enrichment activities. There seems to be some confusion about that, that this was meant to be some type of online school. That never was the intent. That never was the intent of any school district in the state of Michigan. The intent was to have some review and enrichment activities. So we get to today, rolling out 2.0. We've been under the premise since March 9th of 2020 that the state of Michigan and Governor Whitmer was going to close schools for the entire year. We operated that based on what we knew based on what had happened in the state of Washington, that there was no doubt we were going to be in the same boat. And we didn't let any information, positive or negative, come out, sway us from what we needed to do, which is to create an online school for our students so we can move forward. So talking about kind of how we got there, we looked at a couple of different things. One, based on our work with the National Equity Project, and then we're then looking at best practices from the Stanford Instructional Design Model, we began to create what was going to be an online school. And in doing so, we realized a couple of things. One, we realized one size doesn't fit all. That for us and for our community, a cookie cutter approach to say K through 12, this is what it needs to look like, this is what it needs to be, A was not best practices, and B, wouldn't get us where we wanted to be. So as we go through this, we've actually created schools within schools. We've created three separate online schools, a K through five school, a six through eight school, a nine through 12 school, all based on best practices and what should happen. We also looked at four other areas. One is innovation. 
you're going to hear about how K through eight, we have grade level teams. We're one of the few schools in the United States of America that's implemented grade levels teams as far as looking at how we do online learning. So the question probably is why? Why will we look at that? We've learned a couple of things since that date of March. Like I said, we talked about hope. We also hoped, like I said, no one will get sick. We know the sad reality is there's a possibility that not only will our teachers potentially get sick, or they might have a family member that gets sick. By allowing our K through eight grade level teams to operate and collaborate and work together, it allows us to best support all of our students and all of our teachers and all of our families as we move forward. Again, one of the other, one of the few schools in the United States doing that. We also looked at content. We wanted to make sure we looked at what standards do we really need to cover? What is going to be essential for our students to move forward, knowing that we are going to a full online school? And then how do we get there without the administrators, the teachers, our learning service team, IST? None of this would have been a possibility whatsoever. We looked at connectedness. Why do students love school? They love the learning and they love their friends. They love the connections that they have with each other. It's a big part of what they do on a daily basis. How can we recreate that? And then we looked at benchmarking. We not only want to be the best in the country, we want everyone else to know that we've created the best plan in the country. Well, how do we know that if we don't look beyond our own walls? How do we know that if we don't look outside of the state of Michigan? As we built 2.0 in the past two and a half weeks, We've had meetings, whether Skype, Zoom, Google Hangouts, email exchanges with 17 states. That include Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Virginia, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Florida, Texas, Arizona, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, California, and the state of Washington, all sharing best practices. While we have one of the best teams here in Bloomfield Hills, we know that in times like this, if not all times, you need to reach out and learn from other people. It can be one small thing that makes the biggest difference for our community. And we knew when we were presented this plan, we wanted our community to know that we've left no rock unturned to put together the best possible plan. And why 2.0? Kind of like an iOS, iOS update, as we grow, as we learn, we can't be static. Looking at a traditional online school, it's a one size fits all, it's static. Whatever program you start in September, it's the same program you end up with in June. And we knew that's not what the community expected. It's not what the community wanted. And I know as a father of three, I wouldn't accept it for my own family. And so we made sure it's something that can grow and change as we go on. So now I'll share with you an example of a third grade schedule. Notice that I'm going to give you three separate examples of a way to look at it. So if you're a parent looking at home, one of the things that school provides is structure. Students need structure. They also need expectations. So this sample schedule is something you could use. Um, we'll have this online, so if you want to print it out and hang up. But understand it's also flexible. When it says 9 a.m. to 9.15, start your learning with a video bell. If your student likes to sleep until 10, you might start at 10. If your kid's an early riser in third grade and they're up at 7 a.m. and you want to get them started, then get them started. It's okay. You can do that. If you want it to be completely flexible and you decide how to do it, that's up to you. But I know for a lot of families, this will be an easy thing. You can hang up in the fridge and say, here we go. Let's go about it. Another example, looking at third grade, looking at ELA, writing, math, social studies. We wanna make sure they know what the topic is. We wanna make sure they know what the resource is. And we want them to make sure they know the task. What is it they're trying to accomplish? What is it they're trying to do? So if we look at writing, the topic, proofreading and editing, the resource, link to the editing video, your job, go back and edit your paragraph from yesterday using this editing wheel. Again, this is a second way to look at the schedule. The third way, okay, because we all look at things differently. 
we look at the schedule here. You've got the times again. You know your subject, you know your lesson, you know your resource, you know your task. Again, we want to be flexible as much as possible. So if you're a parent, you're watching this and you're trying to figure out what fits best for you, these are just examples that you can use. You may decide that you're better off later of making your own schedule, and that's okay as well. There's no one way to do this. There's no one right way. And your student will kind of let you know what's working for him and her as you go along. So some of the important details. Teachers will check in with students twice per day in addition to a video offering guided instruction or a mini lesson. Let's talk about this twice per day. As we benchmarked against 17 additional states, typically the check-in from a K-5 through teacher was zero to one time per day. Because of the extraordinary staff, the extraordinary teachers here in Bloomfield Hills, they're checking in twice per day. In the 17 states I mentioned, there is not one state that had their teacher checking in twice per day. So if you are a teacher in this district, kudos to you for stepping up and setting the benchmark, not just in the state of Michigan, but in the 17 other states where that's not happening. Also, each teacher will structure their individual check-in times with students according to the needs of the lesson of the day. This is a great piece for the teachers to have their autonomy. What do I need to cover when I check in? Am I looking more social and emotional? Do I need to review the lesson from earlier in the day? Do I need to extend a lesson? Those teachers will decide those touch points and what they need. As always, families are our first partners. You can still reach out to your child directly via email. You can reach out to your building administrator via email. You can reach out to central office people via email. That part of school doesn't change. Questions, concerns, ideas, noticing you have about your child's progress, just like if they were in the building. Email, contact us, let us know. There's also been a lot of talk with our special education, with our special needs students, what will happen. Our goal is to provide support to students within the resources we have through ongoing collaboration with the general education teachers. Special education, learning services team are all one team. These aren't two separate teams. They've completely merged together to talk about best practices. As we talk to administrators in the 17 other states, we've asked them, what is working for you? What's not working? What can you share? And we've implemented ideas from those districts that will best serve us. We're also creating alternate, uh, alternate formats for instruction for those who may be unable to access online learning activities. We also know the stress that's going on with our students and our parents and the continual trauma this is going to cause. So social emotional wellness can't just be something that we do because there's an emergency or because it's a buzzword or we're supposed to because of the state of Michigan. These are things that we're looking to embed in activities and lessons to merge together and having the standalone opportunities for family and students on our website because it's that important. Also, keep in mind if you're a parent that your learner has individual needs and attention spans. Chunking work into amounts of time most appropriate for your child is encouraged. So it might be the suggestion, 20 minutes on this, 40 minutes. Say it's 40 minutes. Your son or daughter might need 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minute break, 20 minutes. You'll kind of see that as you go along. Everyone's going to be different. And students do well with elements of choice in the routine. And I found this to be helpful with my own children as they were growing up. So you might look at our suggested schedule and say, you know what, Pat, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the order that's suggested. But you know what, what do you want to start with today? Do you want to start with math? Do you want to start with the LA? Reading? Do you want to start with your elective? What works best for you today? So having the student has some of that autonomy, might be a great way for them to get started. And think about it. Those are some of the K through five routines, especially early out. Put your little clip where you want to go. What station do you want to, you know, start at today? What do you make your lunch decision? Some of those decisions are natural for our students to make. Now let's look at a six through eight sample schedule. You start your learning with a video bell. And actually I should have brought that up with our K through five um, bell ringer as well. It's actually a video that kind of kicks off the day 
and gets everyone engaged. Same thing with our middle school plan. So 8.50 to 9, kind of create a plan for the day with the idea of being you're a middle school student. You will be in high school in a short period of time. You're a tween. It's time for you to start taking leadership of your own schedule and having a plan that you're able to make for the day. 9 to 9.30, math with guided instruction. 9.30 to 9.45, brain break and movement. 9.45 to 10.15, social studies practice. 10.15 to 10.45, a brain break again. 10.45 to 11.15, math office hours and support. So great, we had our math instruction earlier in the day. I don't think I really get it. I'm kind of confused. I have some additional questions. No worries. This is another best practice that most schools aren't doing. Most middle schools we looked at, those 17 additional states, they did not have the instruction matched up with the office hours. They were on different days. So if you were kind of thrown off by an assignment at the middle school level on a Monday, you may not be able to ask a question until a Tuesday. This was intentionally set up so you can ask that question, especially in math that same day. Um, followed by lunch, science with guided instruction, literature practice, brain break and movement, science office hours and support, or language practice, and then your elective engagement. Electives are still part of our K through 12 curriculum, and they will, they will be included as such, like they should be. Nothing is being taken out. We have, as I said, moved not just to one online school, but three different online schools within the structure. Another way to look at the schedule, math. Topic, resource, and task. But now it's going to get a little different. If you look at science, topic, new unit. Again, moving forward with the curriculum. Interactions with ecosystems. Lesson one, Monday, slides one through seven. Task, go to, go to Google Classroom and complete lesson one from Monday. Google form that goes with your teacher lesson video. Be prepared to talk about this in class. These lessons at the middle school will be turned in using Google Classroom. Students will be turning in assignments. It is the expectation. At 1.0, the expectation was review and enrichment. With 2.0, it's new learning, it's submitting assignments for feedback. That is the expectation for all students. So here's another way to look at the schedule. Now a third way, again, is personal preference. Again, if you're a parent and you decide you want to make your own schedule, 840, your kid doesn't get up, your kid's getting up at 11 a.m., and that's great because you're working from home and you need to get things done, and you can get up at 7 and work until 11 and have some quiet time, no problem. Your student can jump on at that time. Be cognizant, though, of the different office hours. Those are going to be stationary, whereas the instruction is going to be asynchronous. Some important details, 6 to 8. There will be guided lessons each day in two core subject areas, roughly 30 minutes in length. This is new material. This is looking at the power standards that we need to cover to move learning forward, to make sure kids are as close as they can be to where they should be next year. There will be office hours each day in two core subject areas, 30 to 45 minutes in length. There will be activities provided for the other two core subject areas that include practice, review, research, and other engagements. 30 minutes in length. There's a published schedule of guided instruction and office hours on a two week basis. The exemplars nationally are doing it on a one week basis. Again, our teachers, our administrators, and the learning services team stepped up to do it on a two week basis. Why? Because parents need the flexibility. The more flexibility we can provide to our parents in this community in this time of need and crisis, the better. As always, and this is kind of from the other slide as well, families, if you have middle school children, reach out to your child's teacher directly. Questions, concerns, ideas, noticing you have about your individual child. You can reach out to the building administrator. You can reach out to the central office. No different than if we were there. Special ed, social and emotional. Same thing going on here. As far as chunking and kind of looking at the different times, no difference in the elementary level. You might find your child likes to do hour and a half at a time, maybe 20 minutes. They'll kind of lead that way. 
And whatever works for them to be successful is going to be fine. Looking at the high school day, and we're going to look at this through the lens of block scheduling. Sample, schedule day one, 9 a.m. Again, this is something you can hang on the fridge. You can use it as a parent. Your student can cut and paste it and use it. Or you might decide, if you're an early riser as a high school student, 9 o'clock is a little late. That's up to you. Maybe that day you had something else you had to do. Again, there's some choice there. But a sample schedule, day one, 9 o'clock, algebra one. 9.45, your learning engagement, your lesson where you're learning new material. 10 to 11, algebra one, office hours and support. Again, you've had the lesson, you're not sure, you have questions, right away, you can have that additional support if needed. 11 to 11.30, brain break and movement. 11.30 to 12.15, literature, learning engagement. 12.15 to one, lunch and social engagement. That's that connectedness. So if you're a high school student listening, Get on FaceTime, Zoom, Google Hangouts, uh, Facebook. Well, you wouldn't use Facebook Live if you're in high school. Instagram Live, whatever you're using. Be social. Literature from 1 to 2, office hours. <coughs> 2 to 2.15, brain break and movement. 2.15 to 3, biology, learning engagement. 3 to 3.45, newspaper, learning engagement. Example of day two. Again, block scheduling. Um, looking at some of the exemplars national, even some of those that have block scheduling reverted to just a straight schedule to make it easier. Again, our teachers, administrators, and learning services team, even though that would have made it easier just to put a block on a straight schedule out and say, you have eight hours, every class is a half an hour a day, there'll be something for you to do, which a lot of schools nationally did. They refused to do it. Our teachers stepped up and kept it the way the students are used to. So kudos again. So 9 to 9.45, history, learning engagement. 10 to 11, biology office hours. 11 to 11.45, Spanish, learning engagement. 11.45, 11.45 to 12, a quick lunch. 12 to 1, singers, office hours. 1 to 1.30, brain break and movement. 120 to 2.15, PE, learning engagement. 2.15 to 3, algebra 1, 7 to 8, Spanish office hours. Again, each individual student's schedule is going to look a little bit different based on the classes they're taking. Another way to look at it, Algebra 1, World Lit, the newspaper, if that's your elective, we're looking at what the topic is, we're looking at the resources and the task. Looking at the newspaper, capture history as it happens, that's your topic. Resource, spreadsheet in the BHS, BHHS Today Drive, Task, continue sharing your thoughts and feelings about COVID-19 and the school closure by email. Task for World Lit, create a Google slideshow sharing your background re research on the historical time period. If it's Algebra 1, factoring trinomials, watch the instructional video, go to Clever, submit your assignment. Again, just like we talked about earlier, the expectation is for all students to submit the work they're doing. Not to hold on to it, not to keep it for kindling for later. These are expected to be turned in to the teachers. Another way to look at the schedule, again, we're all visual learners in different ways. You've got the time, you've got the subject, you've got the lesson of the topic, you've got the resource, then you've got your expectations. Crystal clear, to the point, if you're a student, you know what you're doing. If you're a parent and you're thinking, what are, what are they supposed to be doing? because I know they shouldn't be playing Fortnite. What should they be doing? This lets you know what they should be doing. And so if I'm looking at 11.30 to 12.15, again, the times you can switch. And my son or daughter is doing something, Fortnite, playing something. And I'm like, okay, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Show me um, from literature or Google Slideshow. I'd like, to, I'd like to see it, share it with me. You know, your background research on the time period, historical contact or influence, and change from modernism, walk me through it. I'd love to see it. So that's part of that accountability piece. A, it's got to be submitted. B, you get to know what's going on. And I would say a neat thing with online learning as a parent, you're now going to know two weeks in advance what your son or daughter should be doing. That typically is never going to happen when your son or daughter's in the school in a building. When they get home, Oh, so what are you supposed to work on? I don't have homework. I don't have anything to do. I'm all done. I'm all caught up. 
And you have to just say, um, sure, okay, I don't know what you're supposed to be doing, so how would I know? We'll see what happens. Now you know, to a T. Some important details with 9 to 12. All right, teachers created that schedule that mimics the current block schedule. They will, teachers will engage in five learning engagements per high school course. It'll be a combination of direct instruction, independent practice, and support, 45 minutes each. Students will have the ability to meet with teachers during office hours for provided feedback and support at least twice per week at 60 minutes. We are moving forward in the curriculum. Again, looking at the power standards. What is absolutely essential for our students to continue learning and moving forward through five sequential learning engagements? Again, as I mentioned before, families are our first partners in education. You can reach out with questions, concerns, ideas, notices, all that like you would during a regular school day to your teacher, to your building administrators, to your central office people, everyone, special ed, social, emotional, Special education led by Jen Perone and her staff, working to make sure we meet the needs as much as possible as every single student. And then our social, emotional, and wellness supports, built in things that we can do to provide that support as needed. Now comes the hard part. None of us have had a child that's been in an online school full time. We've never gone through a pandemic. As a former social studies teacher, I taught about it. It really didn't hit home. I used to think to myself, wow, that, that would really be horrible. I can't even imagine. And I don't even know if I'm completely processed what's going on right now. But we get to the point where there's, there's a whole lot of what ifs. And in a time of crisis, we like the security of knowing what's going to happen next. What, 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 what's next? Well, what if this happens? Uh, what if this happens? Well, what if we go here? And there are so many what ifs now, right now. There's not an answer to all the what ifs. And that's why this is called 2.0, continuous learning 2.0. Because as those what ifs come up, we need to continue to move forward. And how do we move forward? We do that with feedback. We do that by treating everyone with dignity and respect. Before this pandemic happened, every single person in our life was dealing with something that we didn't know about, that was bogging them down, that was weighing them down, that was causing difficulties in their family. That has been multiplied by a thousand times for a lot of people. So as we get feedback, we need feedback from students. There'll be a survey. We're rolling out Remind. It's something that we looked at rolling out next year, but time is of the essence. And we need to do everything we possibly can do to move this district forward as an online school. We are now an online school, period. There's no way around it. That's what we are, and that's what we've been planning for. We'll get feedback with many lessons and teacher check-ins. The closer we can create a sense of normalcy for our students, the better they're going to be. We know the resilient which is great, but we as a school community, as a school district, need to do more. And that's why we're stepping up to the challenge and doing more now. Why do I say doing more? Because I benchmarked it against 17 states in the United States, school districts that we'd all probably send our children to. That's how I know. Staff, survey, and team meetings. I've also created a teacher task force, they'll be meeting directly with me to let me know what's working, what's not working, looking at some of the survey data, and just sharing ideas. Because this is a great time to be innovative. This is a great time to be creative. I've been in education almost 30 years and talking about what if, what if I didn't have to worry about state testing? What if MSTEP didn't matter? What if the SAT didn't matter as much this year? That's where we're at. Those things are not playing a large role in what we're doing. So forget thinking outside the box. Let's get rid of the box. The box doesn't exist. Your imagination is your only limitation as a teacher. It's like a fairy tale to some extent. It's unbelievable. For our families, survey, remind, and other 
digital tools. So this will grow, this will change, this will evolve as we go along. And I couldn't be prouder to be a member of this community, a member of this team, and a member of the school district. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Okay, with, with that, um, I'm, you know, again, just to kind of, you know, just make this flow until, um, you know, at least to give all of my colleagues just an ample opportunity to have questions, and then we'll probably have additional questions. So, Cynthia, um, just to start off with you going in ABC order of my colleagues, uh, do you have any questions for Pat and his team? Well, first, I want to thank his whole team. Okay. For their uh, all of our instructional leaders, um, Todd Pidlock, our assistant superintendent for instruction, Kimberly Hampton, our director of elementary education, Sarah Fairman, our director of secondary education, Margaret Schultz, administrator for social emotional learning and equity educational equity, Wendy Osterman, our data and assessment coordinator, Galilab, our instructional specialist, all of our teachers content area leaders, all of our principals, Dave Shulkin and the whole information technology team. You are amazing. Um, I can't, I so appreciate you for the way you are supporting our students and their family through this sudden horrific ordeal and everything that we are experiencing. I know that you are some of the best education educators in this nation, but you're also mommies and daddies, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers and friends to those you love. And we are all experiencing a fear of the unknown unlike anything we've ever experienced before. Some in our Bloomfield School family have already contracted COVID-19. And thank you for you as you continue to work on to help develop this plan. All of us are in fear that we could become ill at any time. It's only been 16 days since the sudden unanticipated close of our schools on March 12th. Pat, your presentation is concise, straightforward, clear, and pretty. But I know that behind this presentation is a tremendous effort by your whole instructional leadership team to create this framework quickly to help our students and their parents continue their learning through these uncharted waters. We know that nothing we provide right now is intended to say that it should replace a talented professional in person in the classroom with our students. As I tried to process what I read in Governor Whitmer's executive order this morning and connect that information with Pat's presentation tonight, I realized that what is intended here is to support the continued mind development of every aged and abled learner throughout our district through this, throughout this pandemic. We're not trying to create the best new learning plan and platform on the planet for the long term. If that was true, we wouldn't be asking our community to support a bond in August. One of the questions addressed in today's executive order from the governor waives requirements for all of our student assessment and testing, as well as educator evaluations. It does provide for juniors to take the SAT next fall at state expense and provide uh, flexibility so that seniors can take AP tests this spring. I did call MASB this afternoon to confirm with Brad Benasek that um, on page 11 of the executive order section H um, that the, it does address the waiver of district administrator evaluations including the superintendent evaluation. I truly appreciate that Pat and all of our instructional team are well positioned with this plan ready to submit to open schools right away that our teachers can now begin to plan for the for, um, for what will be coming next. It will enable our team to move forward to work with our teachers union to develop the best calendar for our students to start up again. Do we want to add additional days to the calendar before the start uh, before Labor Day? Um, how will that be paid for? Um, how can we create a learning experience that assures that every child is supported to grow and learn and catch up in the fall for what may be, be, asked, be, what may be lost in this uncertain time? 
And that is the most important per, uh, work that lies ahead. Pat, I really appreciate that your plan you created is presented with optimism, with uh, a positive additive, as, uh, and it's addressing this as a creative opportunity for how we can improve our district now and in the days to come. Thank you. Okay, Cynthia, do you have any other questions? Um, with that, I'll go to I'll go over to Howard. Okay, um, Pat, I'd um, like to talk just about some of the logistics and mechanics of this. So the teachers are gonna be developing lesson plans and schedules. Uh, how do they actually roll that out to the parents and the students? Uh, how, do they, how do the parents and students then get that material? And also what is happening with either uh, grades being given and uh, any sort of assessments or tests? Not, not state assessments, but you know, uh, regular uh, formative assessments. Okay, so let me start by answering the first part. It'll be rolled out in a couple ways. One, via email, and two, we're actually rolling out a website where everything can be housed. So it can be kind of one-stop shopping. And that is still being built right now um, as we speak, literally. The other part, as far as assessments, every time a student is submitting something, they're submitting it and it is assessment. It's a formative assessment. So your question is about, are we going to have summative assessments, that unit quiz, that unit test, and what's that going to look like? That's something we're still working through. As you notice with the order from the governor, it says we can't do anything that could harm a student. We don't believe submitting and requiring assignments to be submitted are going to harm a student, but we need to talk about what that grading is going to look like. As far as Grades for marking period three, grades for marking period four. There's been some discussion about what's best practice. I know I've talked to Mr. Colin about that as well. We're going to do everything we can to make sure we do what's best for students moving forward. This is not a time to debate whether or not someone should have a credit or not have a credit. This is a time of crisis. So when in, if we are going to err, we are going to err in favor of the student 100% of the time. So if you're a student, nine through 12 and you're worried about your grade and what's going to happen and well mr watson i i'm typically you know a 3.5 student but i was sick the week before you shut school and i had three c's because i was missing work do i have to keep those c's because i never have had a c in my life and it's going to ruin my grade point and i'm a junior and i'm applying we're going to take care of all of that can i give you the specifics right now no will a lot be on individual cases absolutely now is the time to help now is the time to take the high road. In life, we know what's right, we know what's wrong. Your expectation as a board member is for us to do not just what's right for one student, but for all students. And we will do that 100% of the time moving forward with this. Very good. Let me just, uh, so on the first part, so we're going live with this on the 13th, I believe. Correct. So when, will the parents be able to actually see and the students be able to see the lesson plan and the schedule on that website that's being built? Like, you know, Thursday the 9th, Friday the 10th? How, how's, when should on they the be? How they know on that? the 13th. On, on the 13th. On the 13th, yes. And, and they'll get an email or something that'll tell them to go to this website? Absolutely. Very good, thank you. It'll be on the district Facebook, we'll send it out to communication. We will message, we'll do a robocall. We, use, we will use every means necessary to make sure people have that information. Thank you very much, I'm done. Okay, Jackie. Yes, uh, I'm gonna also say thank you to all the teachers and administrators. This is a very thoughtful, creative plan and also simple enough that it can be really executed. And I'm really pleased to see that the teachers will be working in groups um, across the grade levels. I think that's a, a great way to ensure um, sustainability. And also, you know, the fact that the assessments in the in the MSTED is canceled is fantastic. So my first question 
is about special education. Can you give an example of, in more detail, I've had um, community members ask me and share, they're so anxious uh, about special education. So could you give an example of how teachers will move forward with IEPs, uh, give an example of a, a student with a disability and how they would receive accommodations. That would one thing. So one of them is on special education. The second question is about diversity and equity. So could you give an example of a student doesn't have a laptop or doesn't have internet, um, how will uh, they be able to access the website or can they have paper packets? Um, what would be the type of uh, mechanisms that the school district will use to ensure equity for all students? And the third question, is basically, would we be using, continue using some of our online programs like Prepare You? Uh, my daughter took math classes on Virtual Academy. Um, any type of uh, other types of um, online classes that we might have access to. So those would be the three things, uh, education, diversity, and other types of online courses. Okay, so I'll turn that over in a second to Jennifer, then Dave, and then uh, Margaret. But Jackie, you brought up a great point about the teachers. And I, I do wanna share something that I, I heard mm -hmm. um, from a lot of the administrators nationally. What's going on nationally with a lot of teaching staff is the teachers are asking to renegotiate their contract, that they're saying they don't really wanna work from at home. And so they want a letter of understanding what it's going to mean. And our teachers stepped up and have gone above and beyond. The other thing I've heard from leaders nationally is they have a lot of teachers and this, I don't want this to come off as being judgmental, but have told their administrator, I'd rather take FMLA than teach at home. It's just not worth the hassle to me. So I'm gonna take a couple months of FMLA and then you know we'll figure out what's going on at that point. And if somebody needs to do that, um, please understand they should, and it's necessary to stay there for a reason, but districts are seeing that in mass levels going on. Mm. Um, and I've talked to Phil Liberty, I've talked to tons of teachers, they've been gung-ho about kind of being unleashed to go back and teach, and they've been anxious to do it, and they've been frustrated that they've been held back looking at what came out from MDE and to say that they were excited to finally get to do what they went to college to do is an understatement. Just hear that passion and have them email and saying, about time, let's go, let's do this, it's great. That's great. So yeah, so let's start with um, Jen Prone, if you wanna address a little bit about the special ed piece. And we'll go to Dave and we'll go to Margaret Schultz. Okay. Sure, good evening, everyone. This is Jennifer. Um, so it, what we're working on and what we're working towards is our staff are preparing to work very collaboratively with their general education counterparts. Um, we're encouraging parents to reach out if as their students are beginning to get the work from general education staff, um, if they need some additional support or accommodations, what that might look like so that they're dealing with that more on an individualized basis. Um, we've aligned um, all of our resource room teachers with grade levels so that they're getting that information um, from the grade level teachers as the curriculum is being built so that they're able to give suggestions on what the accommodations may be able to be put in place um, for the materials that are coming out. Just some generic um, accommodation resources that we've put in place. Uh, on the website menu itself, there is an accessibility menu um, that has been built in. Um, and so there's some basic things like Zoom and um, speech to text, those types of accommodations will be available on the website for everyone um, to access regardless of what page they're on. Um, and then we uh, purchased district wide um, for all special ed uh, students that have IEPs or 504s and or general education students, um, some 
uh, support programs that are called Snap and Read and Co-Writer. Um, and those are accommodations, built-in accommodations for any students that would have any type of, uh, that may struggle with reading or writing. Um, there's study tools that are built in there. Um, there's reading support tools where it can be te te text to speech or speech to text. Um, it can do annotations. It can, it has a grade levelizer built in. And so it can take reading levels up or down um, as may be needed, depending on what the text is. Um, and so those are just some generic accommodations that we've tried to build into some of the supports that we're providing. For some of our students that may have some more significant needs, um, we are, those teachers are designing and modifying their curriculum lessons uh, to the levels to meet their students. And they have designated office hours as well as instructional time that they'll be providing to their students to allow for both group and individual time with students. And then uh, for students that may not be able to sit in front of a computer or have access, um, we also have the ability to provide work packets and then the teachers would just work with the students on those packets during their schedule times that they have. And then ancillary staff are also supporting through office hours and doing um, both mini lessons, um, virtual experiences with students, just making sure they're maintaining those connections, but then also supporting their teams and students as, um, as they need it individually. Thank you, Jen. J Jackie, do you mind repeating your question? I was copying on the public comment. I may not have heard all of it, please. Yes, my second question was about diversity and equity. So how will we be supporting students who either don't have laptops, don't have internet, uh, or some other difficulty that makes it difficult for them to access the website? Will we be providing paper packets, uh, phone calls? Um, basically, how do we ensure equity for those students who don't might not have some of the supports at home. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the uh, the long and short of it is we are using all of the uh, devices that we currently have uh, across the district and we are providing those to families. And we've been delivering those right to their doorsteps in the last uh, week and actually the last two weeks for the most part. Uh, so we, as those parents and those families uh, need, they will go ahead and they, they're right now they're submitting through a ticket system and that we're tracking them and contacting them and working through. Uh, the challenge of uh, internet access, we know that it is real out there. We know that- uh, Let me just stop you here. Um, the ticket process, does that, can you go through a phone call to do that? You don't have to go through the internet. That, that is that is absolutely correct. So I was going to, you're getting a little ahead of me on my, my presentation, Jackie, but it's totally cool. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. But no, no, it's really fine. Redundancy uh, is good. good it, it's okay. It's worth talking it through. And so uh, it helps me practice for the next part. But the, the long and short of it is we are creating a new hotline. Um, uh, we're Really, we're expanding our current service desk. And we're going to have two systems that will support our staff and will support our families. And we are, we're reorganizing that so we can provide them the best possible experience going forward. That will include a phone as well as uh, email that they can do. The one thing that we have found and, and from our, our survey and stuff, we know that most of our families have some connectivity of some sort. So we know that they typically can put in an email or make a phone call. And so we're fairly confident around that. But the, the longer part of that, the, the one thing that you're getting to, and this is gonna be a challenge, we're, we're a lot more fortunate, but we're not um, exempt from this challenge uh, in the district. And that's around really uh, reliable and a, a amount of devices and reliable access to internet. And what I mean by is this is simply this. We know that providing a, a device or two to the family may not be enough. We know that when this first started, we put out a survey and families responded, but hey, yeah, I've got three or four devices. We'll be able to share. We're great. But mom and dad now are, are using that device and they can't share or two or three siblings only have one device to share. And we've seen that already um, in the last uh, kind of our last deployment. Those families reaching out to us saying, hey, I'm really sorry. I asked for only one iPad, but now we can't really share it, et cetera. And we're providing those additional devices. 
let me talk to you about uh, internet reliability. The great thing about this is that the all of the basic communication carriers have extended or provided um, no limit to their uh, hotspots as well as their data rate. So that's some relief. But the other part is, is we have been working with the manufacturers or I should say our communication vendors to provide hotspots. The challenge is because everybody around the, the globe or, or at least the, the United States, they've asked for that. We are looking at one, two, three months for some of these vendors to provide hotspots. So we're working with them and we think there might be some state and federal relief to help push some of that, but they're just as challenged as we are. So we know that's a challenge and moving forward with that, we will be able to provide those printed packets and other uh, support materials in a paper or more analog way to help supplement. Uh, as we, we're early on in this and we get two weeks from now, this is gonna be a little bit better, three weeks better, et cetera. We, we, you know, it's just this quick ramp up and we're trying to solve all of these, but. I feel really confident we're going to be able to, to meet those needs for the most part. Thanks, Dave. I can jump in here now. Hi, everybody. It's Margaret. Um, so I think I, I think I wrote down all the questions. I don't think you have to repeat it, but uh, we still have access to use Prepare You. So we will be continuing to use that Prepare You curriculum. We also have um, a phone call scheduled with Ryan Beal, the creator of Prepare You, to see if we can potentially extend um, the at-home services beyond just the students that are currently enrolled in health. Um, when we purchased it, it was purchased for the students in health and you could purchase an additional, um, for families could purchase an additional. So we're looking to see if we can get um, more home options for our families um, in terms of SEL with that. So I, I think we're, we're going to be able to do that. So that should roll out hopefully soon um, once we're able to kind of connect with Ryan. Um, in terms of the students that were on Michigan Virtual High School, um, while not my purview, I used to do that at the high school. I believe that all of that is still continuing. So students would be able to finish their classes. I know we have some students um, at Bowers, but I'm sure at the high school as well, that are um, doing credit recovery on our E2020. Um, those are also still continuing at this point. So we still have access to all of those online classes that students were previously enrolled in and can continue. Um, and I think Dave uh, talked about some of the printing options that we have. We're fortunate that we can get things printed while still maintaining social distancing and have things mailed directly to students' homes. Um, we also know that equity um, internet and computer, those things are huge, um, but also not the only barriers to um, for our students. And so we've been meeting regularly, Jen, Prone, and I both, with um, counselors, social workers, and psychologists, just to make sure that they're keeping their ear to the ground and also our teachers to hear what barriers are there for our students. And, you know, we've said um, we're going to get really creative at this time, whatever we need. If we need to order Amazon and have things mailed to people's houses, we will. Um, so, you know, we just need our teachers to kind of let us know that and we will work to do everything we can. Um, so they're they're making sure that they're paying attention um, to what the needs are of our students out there so that we can we can try to meet everybody's needs on an individual basis. Does that answer everything, Jackie? Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Yep. Those are my questions, Paul. Okay, Jennifer. Hi. Um, so I just want to start by reiterating Cynthia's comments to thank everyone involved in this project. Um, for those of us who have been reading these straw plans from around the country these last two weeks, it, it's dizzying, it's daunting. How much? How long? what's the balance so this this looks like a really strong synthesis of all the ideas that are out there um, and i want to thank you all for reaching out to the wide national community to exchange ideas and i i really hope that that continues um, and i'm very excited about the fluidity of this process um, and the chance to modify with feedback and as pat says uh, although although having to go virtual is in itself a humongous constraint, we, we have other constraints like standardized testing, regular grading that are lifted at this time. So I, I really hope that our teachers and students really embrace this time as, as a time to really be creative and, and take the joy of, of learning and teaching for, for learning's sake. Okay, so um, my questions are three-ish fold. Um, first of all, I, the, it looks like the high school level is the one where um, synchronous or interactive learning is, is listed and built in. 
So my first question is um, at K-5, aside from the check-in, and then for 6-8, um, is there an initial plan to use any interactive sessions or, or synchronous instruction? Um, my question number two is just looking at the high school schedule, um, appreciating that it's not exactly the same as the, the way the periods are structured right now, A and B. Um, will it be tailored to each student? So in other words, um, my ninth grader twice in the last two weeks, he had a conflict where two different teachers were proposing a virtual class at the same time um, and he could only go to one of them. So will, will it be worked out that each high school student can actually attend any, any live sessions for each of their classes um, without a conflict. And then uh, my third question, sort of along the same lines of scheduling, I think I saw an opportunity at the end of the middle school day and, and maybe in the middle of one of the high school days to interact with, with um, elective and special classes and appreciating that, you know, just like hardcore academic learning, it's not every format isn't amenable to, to the virtual space, but but will the students, you know, from six on um, have the ability to have some kind of time where, where they can devote time to their uh, specials and electives like art, music, theater, design and tech, th those kinds of things? Great questions. Uh, Todd or Kimberly, you want to take the first couple and then Todd and Sarah, the last one? Sure. Um, Jennifer, so I, I think, hello everybody. I think I understand the question about the synchronous uh, instruction for K-5. And I think the answer uh, to that is that both options are available at this point for our K-5 learning community. Uh, the videos that will be supported across each of the core areas in the week will um, be a, a static piece for parents and children to access. Uh, as that schedule fits their day, as, as Pat mentioned. And then teachers will also be checking in with their classroom uh, member, with the members of their classroom community twice across the course of the day. And our grade level leads, our, our building administrators, uh, are working those schedules out across the grade level so that there is not um, the crossover in timing that you, that you mentioned uh, that we might currently be experiencing. Uh, we're working to make sure that those schedules are designed for those twice a day check-ins in ways that your second grader, for example, might be asked to check in uh, in a, in a um, synchronous way with their teacher at a time that would be different than the time the fourth grade group might be asked to check in with their teacher. And so those schedules are being designed across the building to avoid um, that overlap. And I think uh, in addition to that, hi, Jennifer. This is, this is, oh, sorry, sounds like I might be getting a lot of feedback here. Um, in addition to that, we're following the same model, six through eight. Of course, our teachers at that grade level work in uh, teams with all four core content areas. So they'll be planning out what that looks like in unison. Um, so it's important to remember that, that uh, as Pat reiterated, what students have been experiencing the last couple of weeks is not the plan to, that is going to be launched on uh, April 13th, that we're talking about two different type of approaches. Um, we first moved into trying to provide enrichment opportunities to keep students engaged. Our number one goal is to stay connected with uh, children. And, uh, as, and then that allowed us time to start building out a more robust uh, seamless approach to an academic framework that would be online. Um, so in regards to at the high school, in terms of trying to mitigate or avoid scheduling, con scheduling conflicts, um, uh, you know, the short answer is yes, that's our goal. Uh, but in reality, it just simply might not be avoidable, but uh, they will constantly look at those schedules and try to minimize those to the best of their capability. If a student is uh, faces that situation, then we're going to trust uh, him or her to make the call based on where they feel like their attendance is needed the most, or maybe try to put value on uh, um, a specific area, provide that feedback uh, for the teacher. 
to see if that scheduling conflict can't be eliminated, but we really won't know until we launch into this and look for those areas. I think our high school has, um, I think we, um, uh, I think we're around 1,500 kids uh, somewhere in there. So it just simply might not be feasible to try to eliminate all the scheduling conflicts, but we're certainly going to try to do the best we can. And Todd, if uh, actually on the screen is an example of how they're doing their meeting schedule at the high school. Sorry, this is Sarah Fairman. Um, so they have started to populate when there are meetings so that they can see this is the ninth grade team here on the screen. And then if you look over on the other side, it's the second week. So they, they as a team made sure that they weren't in conflict with each other. And then um, if I go to 10th grade hours across the bottom, as a team, they're working really hard to not um, overlap the students um, to the best of their ability. Every student has a different schedule specifically after they get out of uh, 10th grade, but the teachers have worked really hard to try to minimize that um, issue as much as possible. And then on the middle school schedule, um, this is, example is just from East Hills. This page you're seeing is actually their contact time or their office hours. And they made it so that sixth grade was meeting at a different time than seventh grade, than a different time than eighth grade, so that families could share a phone or a computer so there wasn't um, fights within the family over what was needed. And then in terms of their actual um, guided instruction versus their practice instruction, they have also mapped that out as well so that the students can have balance in their schedule. Um, which will also assist um, parents and families at home. Jennifer, the reason why this is a little bit easier to do at the middle school level than at the secondary or at the high school level is because at the middle school, kids are traveling with other grade level peers. So sixth graders are traveling throughout their day with other sixth graders. However, at the high school, you might have a sophomore and a junior in the same class or um, you know, students aren't necessarily traveling with just their grade level peers at that point. So that's when, uh, while at the middle school, we'll reasonably be successful, probably not almost having uh, no overlaps there. At the high school, it just simply might not be feasible to do that. But they definitely have a system and a process that they've built to be able to monitor that and to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Um, and just one last comment that I, I think I was almost done with college before I really understood what office hours meant. Um, I know I know we're doing better with advisory now, but if a, a shout out to the teachers to really encourage their students to, to take advantage of those opportunities, because that might not be intuitively obvious to them online. Thanks, Jennifer. Do you have any other questions, Jennifer? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. And then Lisa. Jennifer, I'm sorry. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, Pat. You want to comment before Lisa? Yeah. Went? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify one thing, Jennifer. Great points. And um, as we're building some of this stuff, once we have it done, we'll be able to roll it out. Uh, for example, if the website is done before the 13th, we'll be able to get that information out. Once all the lessons are built, we'll be able to get that out hopefully before the 13th as well so that the people can see it ahead of time. Um, but we can't give a definitive date. I would hate to promise something and not deliver. So at worst, it'll be the morning of the 13th, but we're hoping to get it done before. But we are literally in the process of building all that behind the scenes. Thank you. Okay. Lisa? Hello. Um, I, first, I, I want to thank everyone uh, for being patient, for being understanding, and for being kind to one another. Um, I have seen and heard people being flexible, being understanding, being supportive, and I appreciate that a lot. Um, also, a really big thank you to everyone behind the scenes working, especially the IT department who um, has repeatedly put themselves at risk by delivering devices, hand delivering, um, and even coming up with some innovative ways to get devices to far away students. Uh, thank you for all that. H here are my questions. Um, the first one is, uh, I'm curious with, I, I like the plan a lot and I think, um, I appreciate the flexibility and that it's going to be changing and evolving as input um, it comes in 
weekly input. I want to also say that there's an anonymous way to send input, um, I know, for teachers as well. So I think that that's an important part of, uh, to me, of getting feedback. Um, how, here are my questions. How is teacher input reflected into the plan? Um, specifically, I'm kind of concerned with some of the scheduling that I see. Um, I'm wondering with elementary school teachers where they're at four different buildings and may not be aligned in terms of curriculum, how are we starting with the same curriculum in the same place? What if they're starting in vastly different places? Um, and what if they're accustomed to using different resources? Second question, um, what additional tech resources are we making available to teachers who uh, document scanners or even classes and how to teach um, a virtual class? What, what help are we providing uh, troubleshooting issues? They want to log in at a certain time and for some reason they're having a tech issue at my house the remote server from my job crashes every five minutes and uh we have you know our own tech person that we call all the time what what are we going to do in those kinds of situations um another question is um some some of them have been asked already so i'm trying to skip over those um what what are we going to do for parents who don't like this plan, want to modify it, want a different plan. Obviously, uh, you know, from what the governor said today, we cannot make mandatory participation. Uh, we can't make grade level advancement or graduation um, mandatory, tied to mandatory online requirements. But what are we doing? What kind of message are we sending parents who might want to do either more or less or different kinds of things with their children at home um and also i had a question about our esl and dhh students i know that we have purchased the voice to text and vice versa uh how are we able to accommodate students with maybe um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, some of the other, um, are they going to have the resources that they have available to them technologically that they have during the school day? Are we able to provide all those? That's, those are, I think, the ones that we need. Okay. So we'll start with the learning services team, then we'll go to Dave, and then we'll go to Jim Perone. Okay. So I, th I think, uh, Lisa, thank you for that. I, I think probably where I'd want to start, and I think it's really worthy of a discussion and um, uh, for us really kind of have an understanding of, of the variance that parents are going to be under in terms of um, uh, some are going to be overwhelmed with this plan. Um, we expect some students will do this and more. We expect some students will struggle to keep pace. We expect some students to not be able to keep pace, and we expect that some students may participate very uh, infrequently. Um, and actually, as I described that, that's not very uncommon than, than what we uh, might experience in, in a traditional setting, but we expect those percentages to change um, uh, quite rapidly. Um, and, and so if I was just speaking to a parent, if I was on a phone call with a parent that's struggling to keep up, um, one of the things that I would be talking about is, is helping them, and this is what a teacher or a principal could do, help them prioritize the day. Not to worry if, uh, if there's a struggle within the home to keep up, to prioritize based on the importance. Um, in general, I would probably be saying we should be practicing math every day, we should be reading every day, and then try to roll in from there um, the priorities that a specific learner might have for their individual needs. Um, one thing to keep in mind as we move through this plan is that um, uh, without having the students at school um, and also not wanting to penalize students for who that will not be able to really attend in the same way they would in a physical sense in a classroom, 
um, that we're going to hold those students harmless. We'll also be monitoring and, and doing um, uh, progress checks so that as we start next school year and all the students come back, we can really move forward with an intelligent design that really starts to look at the gap that was that was created during this closure. I think in total, um, I think we're going to be closed about 59 to 60 school days. And if I was just speaking to an average parent, I would say, okay, let's start with that. We're, we're not looking for a year's worth of growth because we were in school for two thirds of the year. So we're looking at 60 days. If, if, if at the very least you can get 10 to 20 days worth of growth, we can design next year's calendar to really focus, to make sure that we are picking up um, in some of those areas that we didn't, we weren't allowed to attend to um, because we weren't able, able to be there. So as we kind of monitor the success of students as we move forward and their engagement and those students who aren't able to engage, um, we'll be able to have really kind of a, a, a script or a analysis about how to start next school year. So it's important not to look at this plan as like a holistic approach that everything is gonna live within the next few months here. Um, because really what we can do is we can also leverage the experience of the next year to also try to compensate for those areas in which an online platform maybe isn't going to be in a student's realm of, of greatest success. So we'll be taking a look at both of those as we, as we move forward. Um, so what I would do is I would try to really kind of help the parent um, where, who is feeling like I'm not going to be able to keep pace, I'd help them prioritize their day and um, be able to really kind of loosen the burden a little bit in terms of, okay, let's take this piece off, this piece off. Um, but for those students that are ready to um, keep moving forward, maybe work a little bit more uh, dependently in the household, um, they were probably the same way in a classroom. They may be able to sustain um, pretty readily kind of moving moving forward. All right, Kimberly, Todd, did you want a really to quick question. Sorry, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but uh, and for the students who and parents of those students who are finding it not challenging and deciding to do their own thing, uh, so they're not logging in daily, but uh, parents know about it and are comfortable with it, what are we sending the message of that, uh, you know, they're to be trusted with their child's education and work as long as, you know, the adults involved are comfortable. Like kids who aren't logging in aren't necessarily being marked absent or, um, you know, right. the, I can they're not putting of... work in, it's not being held against them. Well, the work isn't going to be optional. The expectation is they need to turn the work because we have to decide whether or not we have to, if we can issue credit. So this isn't like, in, you can have A or you can have B. This is required. Now, there might be circumstances where students, for whatever reason, can't get the work done. But if I'm a teacher at home and I know, Lisa, I have you in class and you haven't submitted work, I need to call you. I need to reach out and find out what's going on. No different than a regular school day. Lisa, I haven't heard from you from three days. You haven't checked in during office hours. You haven't submitted the past two assignments. What's going on? This is not, you know, a la carte where people can go and do their own thing. We need to get back to teaching and learning. We need to get the curriculum covered. We need to do everything we can to reach out to those students who might be suffering. Maybe they're sick, right? We need to know that. Maybe they're taking care of their parents or a sibling, and then we need to provide some different supports for them but that's our job and we need to do our job because that's what everyone's counting on. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, but I'm saying for the, for the student who, you, who you've made contact with and with whom you know uh, it's not an issue of being sick or having parents that you know are out of the home, they've made a conscious choice to do a curriculum they find more rigorous, for example. So it would be no different than a student saying, all right, Mr. Watson, I'm going to turn to my work for your class, but I'm going to do some additional things because I want to get ahead. I'm doing an independent study in AP European history because I want to take the test. They still need to do the required work. We still have to issue credit. And there are always those kids that are super hyper-motivated that want to do more, that are going to spend all summer going over geometry so they can test out, so they can take algebra, honors algebra two freshman year because they want to get to, um, you know, Calc 3 and Diffie Q, or they want to get to linear algebra by the time they're a senior. That's fine. And if I'm a parent, I'm sitting at home saying, well, I have Mr. Bidlack right now. And the work that's coming home, my kid could do this with the eyes closed. My kid needs more of a challenge. 
And as a parent, I'm emailing my teacher, Mr. Bidlack. I'm saying, Mr. Bidlack, thanks for the work. Appreciate it. My kid is bored by this. It's not enough. I need more. What challenging things can what you do? Challenging what you need to do. <laughs> Sorry to jump in, Todd. No, that's okay. I think Kimberly's going to jump in Kimberly's next. Kimberly's going to jump in next. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everybody, for the, the questions regarding teacher input and alignment. I think that's uh, been a big question for us uh, even prior to um, the dismissal from school. We've been working hard, particularly in the K-5 level, um, for the past two years in considering alignment, particularly with mathematics and reading and writing. And so those grade level district-wide teams that Pat spoke of uh, at the, st at the start <clears throat> have been really critical in coming together to determine some of those alignments. As we know, our teachers really have uh, student needs at the heart of their decision-making and we know where there is variance across building. Um, th those collaborative conversations that have been happening all week have included those very same concerns. And so our teacher teams are thinking about their current pacing, thinking about where their individual classes are aligned uh, within that pacing and making decisions for April 13th that reflect those decisions. Uh, we've really empowered those groups to, to think about our shared curriculum resources um, in mathematics, reading and writing, and using those as launching points for um, some, some common instructional points. But we also know this isn't a one size fits all model. And so uh, where we'll have some teaching points uh, that are common across that uh, template that Pat shared in the beginning, teachers are also checking in with their own individual students um, you know, in third grade, for example, these are our experts in eight-year-olds, and they know as content shifts across the course of the year where things get complex traditionally for an eight-year-old, whether they're under the roof of the school building or whether they're at home, um, and where things are going to need to stretch uh, perhaps with another day or two of practice and where they can continue to move along with those curriculum pieces. And so um, our grade-level teams, uh, led by those principal grade level leads are in uh, contact with one another right now. We've got a steering committee sort of organization that's that's guiding that work along the way. And as Pat also mentioned, in terms of feedback, uh, we've got a, a teacher task force that will be coming together when we return from break that will continue to help us consider how to revise and refine these plans uh, to continue to best meet the needs of our students. So th those are our plans thus far in terms of alignment and, and teacher input. In addition, when the plan first came out, this is Sarah Fairman. Um, thank you, Lisa, for the great questions. The plan came out with, I think at one point, we may have had 65 people in our crisis room um, because we wanted to make sure we had as much input, input and voice as we possibly could. So we had teacher leaders. We didn't have classroom teachers at that time because they were still in the classroom. And then the governor's order came out that night. So we were not able to gather them um, physically in the space that we wanted. So we launched on that first Monday, and I'm sorry I lost the date, I wanna say maybe it was the 15th um, of March, we launched this new idea of collaboration around um, team, grade level teams and also building teams. And through that idea, the teachers have been able to identify where we are, where we should be and moving forward. And so when Pat talked about the power standards, that's something that they have really identified in terms of we understand that at home learning is not going to be the same as classroom learning. They're missing out on the group work. They're missing out on learning from their peers, um, all those dynamics of the classroom. So how do we narrow down those power standards to make sure that the content is strong in there? Um, no, sorry, the content is strong and then that the students can then um, be confident in what they know. And when they come back to us in the fall, when we embrace them, we will go back to the idea of that collaborative learning environment. So that's where oftentimes in the um, last two or three weeks, things have felt really uncomfortable. And that's because we are so used to this unbelievable collaborative environment that we have built here at uh, Bloomfield Hill Schools. And then to suddenly be on an island by yourself in front of a computer um, was a big adjustment for everybody, teachers and students alike. We feel this new plan allows for a collaboration both between the teachers, um, grade level teams, building teams, but also collaborations with teachers and students. So we are looking forward to um, the community that we can create online moving ahead. Thank you. I, I understand that and I do appreciate these are uh, unbelievably difficult times and the and what you've been tasked with is also unbelievably difficult, but 
I can't help but wonder if by taking, uh, we're taking the method of teaching away or vastly limiting it because we can't, we don't have, uh, you know, live interaction capabilities and we're forcing things to happen virtually and online, but taking away the ability of teachers to create a curriculum provided that it meets state and uh, local benchmarks, I, I wonder if we're not taking away their autonomy and how they're reacting to that. Um, also, I, I just want to get back to making sure that we have provided resources for all of them so that um, this new method of teaching over the next couple months becomes familiar enough to them. I mean, are we giving them uh, enough training in how to teach an online class or how to how to even to run a virtual meeting, classroom meeting. Um, and, and again, uh, for the students we know we cannot reach, how I really do appreciate when we come back next year that we have this huge task of trying to figure out where we are. And I know everyone's understanding, but the ones that we're not going to be able to contact and help over the next couple months. What extra things have we already come up with? Um, Pat, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the, um, you were telling us in a meeting a few days ago about some of the resources that we can subcontract for with uh, specifically for the uh, special needs community resources that are used to dealing with online um, teaching of various kinds of special needs. Right. So as we encounter, you know, different barriers and constraints, we're going to reach out, even if it's third party vendors, if we have to hire them and use that. Now is the time to do whatever we have to do. Yeah. As far as teacher autonomy, a couple of different things. Part of our crisis plan is having this grade level alignment. Um, heaven forbid we have three teachers or four teachers in a certain grade level fall ill or their relative or their student or their own children fall ill, we need to be able to be nimble and quick. That's what I've heard from talking to business people. Can you be nimble? Can you be quick? Schools are notoriously slow. You guys sit around, you discuss stuff for four years. Then by the time you make a decision, it's too late, it's passed you by. So we have to plan for what could be the worst. Now for me as someone that taught for almost 20 years, Fine, this is the lesson we all agreed to do. It's great. But you know what? During my two check-ins that I have each day, I want to teach two different lessons, things that my kids are passionate about, things that I'm passionate about that I think my kids need to learn because my kids are further along in something, that I'm going to do it at that point. And again, as we have the surveys, and I agree with you, Lisa, for the staff, even if we have to use a different you know, survey monkey or a third-party vendor, it needs to be anonymous so they can flat out say whatever they want and not feel like they're being restricted. Also, with the task force that I'm running for the teachers, it's just myself and the teachers. There's no one else involved. And I've selected not people that were my former students because I already know they're going to give me their brutal, honest truth no matter what. That's already going to come. I reached out to teachers that I've never um, had a relationship with before I started in January. People I've watched come across their teaching, saw different things they've done. And these people seem like, you know, although I don't know them as well as some others, they're going to be really upfront. And in the exchange I had with one in particular the other day, and she said, well, what are you really looking for me? I said, I want you to be brutally honest. What's working, what's not working, Maybe your own children in a different school district can pick up something really small that we can steal that would work for us. This is going to be a full team effort. And if you're on a team, you can yell at the top of your lungs what you feel is right or what you feel is wrong. Then at the end, we reach consensus and we're on the same page. We walk out of that chat room or whatever, Zoom, WebEx. I don't know what, what are we on today? Google Hangouts. Um, and then we're all together. It's going to be different. This is going to be unique. There are going to be some trips along the way, and that's okay. For a lot of our staff, this is a huge lift for teachers. You have to redo every lesson you've ever thought of, and not just looking for a way to improve it or maybe make it better, but redo it to fit some type of online learning 
that you haven't spent time training for. I look at my two younger children that took online classes. And what, did it, what does it look like? Do an online school. They took it to work ahead so they could take the electives they wanted in school, like so many children do even in Bloomfield Hills. You get on the computer, you log into a website. If you have a question, you email the person. Maybe they get back to you in a week, two weeks later. You do your little modules. You do your little work here. And then what most students do, just to be upfront, they have their computer, they get their assessment, they open the second computer, they Google the answer, and they put it in. And so we're really looking at how can we kind of give students questions to pursue, right? Looking at it differently. How can we give students something to create, something tangible? And as our teachers get more and more used to their new online school, they'll become more and more creative. The more risk they take, the more reward it's going to be. And it's going to be the same thing for IT. We're asking them to, instead of just provide support, you know, and, and Dave and his team have been wonderful, you're not just providing support if you're Dave in IT. You're the school. You are the school now. It's you. Everything hinges on, to some extent, what you can do and the support you can give. That's why Dave and his team have been looking to staff as much as possible. They've reached out to people who might be interested. Dave and his team are looking at the pairs that are provided support to get them trained. I know Dave, Sam, and others are looking at how they can train them next week so we can hit the ground running. If we have a wait time with IT, it's not going to be because we didn't try to hire or get everyone we, we could to be penny wise and pound foolish. It will be we reached out to every possible resource possible. And this is the total team we could come up with. There was no more to be had. And if that's the case, then it is what it is. But I'm really, I really think people need to understand we're an online school. And there's a heavy burden on Dave and his team now, like never before, to support 5,540 kids and their parents. And they're also going to get those odd questions. Uh, my Wi-Fi keeps glitching. Okay. You know, like I, I shared with the team the other day, I find out my Wi-Fi glitches when I have two kids streaming Netflix. So even for tonight, I talk to all three of my kids, don't go on Netflix. Can't be on Netflix when I'm on the computer because it's going to bog down, it's going to glitch, and I'm going to sound like a robot or a moron when I have to give this presentation. They're like, fine. I'm like, don't take the dog out. Don't let the dog, like this new sense of normal. Um, so again, I'm, I'm proud of the effort everyone's given. Um, but we do need to have some patience with IT if there are some glitches along the way, um, because they're absolutely doing everything they can. Lisa, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, I don't have any more, but I didn't really hear the answer to what we're going to do for the students that we cannot reach until next year. Do we? I know we're we're going to catch them up, but uh, I mean, this is going to involve like a painfully long school day for them. How? Um, I apologize, I didn't address that. So it starts by reaching out to the student, um, whether it's by an administrator, by the teacher, and if it's just simply or the counselor. If it's simply they don't respond and we know they're safe, they're not in harm's way. Um, I know based on past precedents, if they don't respond and the parents don't respond and you get nervous, you call the police and they do a well check on the student and they can verify that the student is healthy and is safe as a worst case scenario. But we're gonna have to work with the counselors, administrators and teachers. We might need to look at that first month of school. First of all, we need to plan on what the first month or week's going to look like. That first week might just be a celebration of being back in school, as opposed to you're back, you missed time, you got a lot of work to do, and there's so much, and you're going to be so far behind and stress everyone out. And then one of the good things about working in these bands, K through eight, we know what the major learning targets are. We know what they hopefully have learned. We could also build assessments around that because they should have a shared common knowledge. And then where are their gaps? We may need to offer an extra program after school. One thing I talked to Charlie Hollerith and his uh, team about was this idea. Knowing that math has been difficult for a lot of our students for multiple reasons, what if we built a teacher schedule so that they're still teaching full time, but 
but they start later in the day. And then their last hour of the day is after school. And we provide tutoring after school free of charge for students with two of our math teachers. Right? Again, now's the time to be innovative. Now's the time to think outside the box. There is no box. What is your ideal school? What is your ideal classroom? It's all online now. So a lot of this is going to be, you know, the what ifs. And we need to keep flushing them through. And so the task now will be for LST. We started with 2.0. How do we get the feedback? How do we make updates? How do we keep moving forward? How do we plan for next year to cover in one school year that we needed to cover in probably a year and a half, right? Maybe a year and a third, right? We need to do 1.3 years in one year. We have to be very concise. We have to have a really good plan. We have to be smart about it. And we need to make sure everyone is on board. I mean, it's, it's quite a challenge, but having worked with LST and the teachers I've been talking to and the administrators, I think it's a breath of fresh air. I think it's great to have a different challenge and not have the same old, same old. We would all hope it wasn't in a pandemic where people are getting ill and losing their lives, which is absolutely horrible. But I think this can really reset us as a district and allow us to move to the forefront of where we wanna be and be on the cutting edge of 21st century and not where we were the past two and a half weeks, reeling on our heels, listening to the guidance from what we were supposed to be doing, and then hearing, well, this district's doing this, and this district's doing this, and I call the districts, they're like, Pat, we're doing exactly what you're doing, and then we have people all over the board with you know, what's going on. We need to be succinct, concise, continue to move forward, all is one. I'm rambling, I'm sorry, Lisa. Any other questions, right. Lisa? No, thank you. Okay, Mark. Mark, you still there or you're on mute? I'll jump in. Um, we can we can get back to Mark. So uh, my first question, um, I know it's a concern. And Kelly, I know we talked about it earlier and maybe you want to make a comment. I know um, a lot of our families and students have personal belongings in the building. And I know the executive order gives um, um, our educators discretion, obviously, based on what's going on in, you know, in terms of social distancing and, you know, all the social concerns. It, is there a plan or what would be the plan um, for our students to get some of their belongings uh, in the building since they're going to be out of the building's minimum to the end of the year? Yeah, so we would have to wait until the shelter in place order has been lifted. Um, additionally, Oakland County has a number of um, additional steps that need to be taken, even for our essential personnel. So while we are going to do the best we can to make sure teachers have access to resources they need to be successful with this program, um, for students and their families, we're going to have to wait until the shelter order has been lifted. Okay, and then just just in line with social emotional, this is you know as you know un unfortunate if some of our families you know do do in fact get you know um, you know someone in their family has their coronavirus. I know Kelly, we talked about this. Um, you know what is um, I guess the some of the supports or are we putting supports in place for those students and families as a district um, that they can you know reach out to if you know more and more of our families do do in fact um you know have some of these these issues that they're gonna have to deal with i don't know pat so we do have a crisis team available to provide support to students okay so so i i guess in the future we'll roll out or we'll talk through you know or i guess we'll well, obviously, okay, so I, I guess we do have a crisis team and we'll make that, you know, th those areas where our students and families will make that available. Yeah, I think that should be part of the FAQs that we're going to put out. Um, okay. And so, you know, if you, if you need support from a social worker, or psychologist, or counselor, we need to make all that readily available. And I know that's something that's being worked on the FAQs as well. Um, but the primary focus has been on rolling out this new version of our continuous learning plan. Paul okay. and Pat, I think 
can you hear me? I think uh, Kelly um, answered that, but I think she was coming in and out. So you probably didn't hear a part of that. Um, okay. There is, we already have a network in place that is a crisis team. So oftentimes you can think of social workers, child psychologists, our counseling staff, administration. There's quite a network in place um, uh, because that is something that's part of any given year or families in crisis or, or um, of course, this is a, this could be a different magnitude than, than um, uh, what we typically uh, help support families with. But um, I did hear parts of what Kelly said, and I think she was referring to the crisis plan that we already have in place. So it wouldn't necessarily be a new rollout. It would be tapping into that, that network and those resources that we do have. I know there's already been conversations behind the scenes in terms of kind of giving some reminders for that, refreshing that. Um, so if a family needed support, if we knew that, um, it would start with connecting with the family and seeing, and seeing what resources are available. Um, and, and helping them move in a healthy direction when possible. Okay. Um, my next question, Pat, you may not know this. This is more geared toward, you know, it's probably the high school team, or maybe Sarah, you know this. Uh, uh, concerns that I've heard throughout this, and now it's a, a concern, is, uh, is in terms of grades, uh, in terms mm -hmm. of our high school grades at the point mm -hmm. of time when they left for that the year. A, you know, how will they determine the grade, and B, if you go to some model that a lot of the colleges are going to, some pass fail slash option model of their actual grade, how will that be reflected on the transcript? Right. So if we were go to a pass fail, it would simply be a pass, which a lot of the college models have gone to. Another college model I've seen is if you like the grade you have, you can keep it. If you don't like the grade you have, it will be a pass. We're still trying to flush that out, and we'll make sure we message that to everyone involved. So if you're a student, I know it's not the answer you want or the answer you need, but do understand that a lot of this will also be done on an individual basis and what's the best, what's best for that individual student. So no one's going to get the short end of the stick. Colleges, um, read an article yesterday, University of California School System, so you know, uh, Cal Berkeley, Caltech, um, their whole system, um, they're expecting to see transcripts that just have pass on. So it's not going to be a negative, you know, the NCAA for some classes, if you had a pass, they would record it as a D in your GPA. Uh, they've let it be known that that's not going to be an issue to have the, the pass or a D letter grade. So a lot left to be determined, but this is not going to hold anyone back from their dreams of doing whatever they plan to do um, post high school. Okay. Also and just a conversation about middle school as well, because they were receiving grades, yeah. sixth grade through eighth grade. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, one of the concern, one of the questions, and this was actually posed by a student, is if you, you know, if you do do some type of model like that, how will, will it be reflected on their transcript as if elected to take pass for his actual grade or will just be passed? It's just something to consider, not necessarily, you know, in addition to what's going to happen, but what will be reflected on the transcript that eventually goes to colleges. So, this is Sarah, when you um, send your transcript off to college, there's always a... Um, a document that goes with it from the school itself that explains the grading system. And there would obviously be a, a caveat in that document that explains the grades, why it was happening. And colleges are going to know we are not the only people who have COVID issues. The colleges are going to be fully aware of everyone with COVID. So my understanding is that new, that new high school profile, every single school will put in there, this is our COVID response. This is how we handled it. This is how it's going to look in the transcript. So that will be explained um, to every college along with the transcript as it goes out. Whatever we decide to do with COVID, um, that will be explained in that document as well. Okay. Then my next question is going back to the school bells uh, at the beginning of the day. So obviously it's the school bell, I think I read it or was presented, it's K through five. Let's just look at the K through five. Is mm -hmm. whatever is being presented because you're gonna have you know some students at a kindergarten level, some students at a fourth grade level, and then you have obviously buildings that are K through three and some four and five. How is that gonna work with different buildings and different levels? Todd or Kim or, yeah. So the way it's gonna work is every school is gonna do their own school bell. So there'll be a Conant school bell, a Way school bell, 
that will be um, a member of the school staff that every student knows or is familiar with who will kick off the day in terms of just welcoming the kids, getting excited about what's going on. Maybe if there's a theme for the week, continuing that theme for the week. Um, we have seen some really great ones that have already been um, made and I don't wanna share them because they're the kids will love them. But the idea is to build that community at the beginning and to get things started. So every school will have its own school bell and it's designed for all, all grades in that school except for the high school. Okay, all right. So it's not like reading a story where, where it won't be relevant. We're gonna make sure it's relevant to everyone in the building. Exactly. Yeah, and okay. there might be reading a story, but it might be, you know, let's say they decide to pick up a, a book and read the story for the whole week. That might be something along with it. I do know that most of the schools have decided that the first week back will be all of the their main office people. So it's something that all the kids know and can connect with to really kick off the whole program. Okay. Paul, and then can a I question. piggyback on that? Oh, sorry. Yep. Can I piggyback yep. on that real quick? So there, there's some why in the background to that. You know, why not just have the principal every single day? Why not just have one teacher every single day? When our students come back, some will be transitioning to a new building. Others will not. They'll be in the same building. The more familiar faces they have when they walk in those first couple of weeks of school, the better. So maybe you're a first grader and you're coming back and you've seen a couple of videos, three or four, with that second grade teacher and you have that teacher. It's like, oh my gosh, Mr. Cullen, I saw you on the video. You read the story about the red panda or you did the funny this or the funny that. So it's to build that sense of community so when the students return, it feels familiar no matter what teacher they have or what adult they see in the building. All right, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 that's fine. Um, and I think Pat, maybe you know, I, I, one of my colleagues asked this question, but I, I'm I'm going to ask I'm going to ask it, and, and also challenge it a little bit. So if we're starting on April 13th, and a big portion of our community they want to prepare with our kids, is, is there no way for I guess, and I, I get it, we have spring break for those initial lessons, you know, you know, to be presented. Um, before that Monday, so when they're opening up, maybe they can help, you know, prepare their kids, or is it is it set in stone now that um, it's going to be happening, that everything's going to be released that Monday on the 13th? No, and that's kind of what I, I was telling uh, Jennifer. That is our drop-dead date. That's when everything starts. If we get okay. it done sooner, if we have it done Wednesday of next week, we'll release it. People can look at it. They can play on the website. They can get used to it. They can play on the schedule. They can have their sample schedule that they may like, you know, whatever works for them or build their own schedule. You know, maybe, you know, if I have a fifth grader at home, I say, all right, here's what you're supposed to do next week. I want you to come up with your plan. What plan works for you? You take ownership. You plan how you're going to go about your learning next week. So now, as soon as we get it done, we'll release it. But I would hate to say, we'll have it done by Wednesday and we don't have it done because as a parent, I'd be frustrated. Don't tell me you're going to do something and not do it. But as soon as this is done, we will get it released. Now, will parents, and, and probably more at the, the earlier, will, will parents be required to be with their child during some of these presentations, or is it going to be uh, you know, self-sufficient where, you know, a third grader or a fourth grader, you know, can kind of, once they put them in front of the computer, you know, the, the teachers or, the, or whatever is the website will help them navigate through it. How much parent involvement will be required uh, during a, a typical week um, for these students? Right, so the obvious answer, the simple answer is it depends on the child, but let me be more specific. So what will happen is like the video, the bell ringer, as the click, you know, they're clicking a link, they can do that. As far as the mini lesson, they can do that. It shouldn't be an issue. A lot of the things that are going to involve the student, especially if they're third, fourth, fifth grade, they should be able to do a lot of it on their own and navigate it. The two check-ins with the teacher should, per day shouldn't be a problem whatsoever. And as we continue to move forward as an online school, the students are only going to get more and more comfortable with the technology, more and more comfortable with the routine. Again, we're building structure and routine because that's what students need um, to help them be successful. Okay. Sarah, did you want to show something? I just wanted to share, this is just a sample screenshot of what the page will look like when it goes live. 
So um, I'm not, the links aren't live, so I'm not gonna click on them, but this is what you would land on. On the top would be an option for K5, 6, 8, 9, 12, and then you would go to, you would start your day of learning here, you click there, you go to your school, you go to your day, you watch your video, it starts your day, and then you go to kindergarten, first grade, whatever your grade is, um, it's laid out for you in that plan. So um, once we have it up and going, that will be released, but it is uh, much more user-friendly. And I think that was some of the comments I was seeing as well is this is a one-stop shop where you would go to one spot to find everything that you need um, in that area. And that should also help with all the emails and you know the 27 emails that we hear that parents are getting, that will stop this because everything will be in one's place. And so when you're asking if students can do it independently, as they become more comfortable with this, they can, uh, manipulate this site independently okay and and getting to that just piggybacking on that uh, and i know you know i mean we're, we're trying to go eventually to one platform uh, especially at the high school so is this the, is there only really at this point one platform that parents will be going to which is this um so they don't have to learn six or seven different platforms you know with this online learning virtual learning Uh, unfortunately, the platforms, the different platforms will stay because every platform has a different uh, purpose. The idea is that they don't have to go to their email anymore to find out what they're supposed to do, that there'll be one um, space that they can go to on the website that allows them to click into what they need to do. There will still be different platforms. Envision is one, um, you know, Edpuzzle is another. It depends on what the teacher has selected that day to uh, further students' learning. Okay. And we'll, um, we'll how, how much in, from a technology point of view, just getting back to technology, will, will, they, will students have to be printing out a lot? Well, are printers required or are families going to need printers uh, to print out certain things? Or is the answer to that no? I will happily jump in on this one is, uh, is we really, there is no need for that, right? So we're, we've been a Google suite for a number of years. And we will be using those tools to, to submit and collaborate and create and share. So those, those are the tools and the tool sets that we will continue to use in the digital realm. And we don't anticipate any need for any printing. We do know that particularly in our early elementary, we're gonna have those things that, that we may want to engage a little bit differently. We've got to think those through where we're working on those motor skills, et cetera. And some of those things may be more of an, in an analog environment. And we'll have to kind of explore what those opportunities and needs and solutions might be. So I don't have a great answer on that. And there might be someone else who might chime in. But from a technology, te from a technology perspective, we are, this is a great place for all of us to digital transform into those tools that we're using every day. OK. And then, Dave, just, just on that, and maybe you answered, I think Lisa may have asked this question. So if I'm online as a student, you know, and or, and or a teacher and something's happening, technology, like Lisa says, my job, I call an 800 number, you know, someone comes on, takes control of my screen and works through me. What, what, what are those technology supports? Maybe I didn't get it in the answer to Lisa that a student, family and or a teacher are, is gonna get from the district. I'm happy when I jump into my little bit of a presentation that'll kind of outline some of that stuff. Uh, but okay. we have thought about those things for sure. Okay, yeah, that's fine. All right, um, that's all the questions I have. So um, I think Mark's back on. Mark? Paul, you're muted right now. Okay, no, no, I'm, it's, it's, it, I don't know if Mark once I think Mark's back on. So it's I took over Mark's turn. Well, all right, if, if somehow we're still having technology problems with Mark, then I guess I'll hand it, I guess, Dave, if you want to go through your technology report. Yeah, um, well, can, I, can I have can a someone one. reach out to Mark real quick, okay? And I'll jump in and then Mark, do I'm, sorry. I, I'm sorry, one second, Dave. I think um, I'm clarifying, I think, Howard said he has one more clarifying question. Yeah, um, a, a, a few things. One, um, one of the questions was, oh, I think Paul one of the had a question related to allowing parents in to pick up uh, uh, material. And um, I just wanted to uh, augment what Kelly said. 
that the executive order that the governor issued this morning does permit uh, districts to allow parents and guardians of pupils to visit the school building to pick up materials. So um, you, if you just look at the executive order, it, there is a uh, provision in there for that. Um, uh, two quick questions. One is, uh, Pat, if you can address kind of, we have a uh, three satellite programs. We have preschool, which is Blooming Kids and GSRP. We have Bowers and we have Wing Lake. Um, how are those going to be addressed? And then second is, uh, what are the role in this uh, new environment for uh, paraprofessionals? Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to LST. Uh, in terms of Bowers, I can, I can, oh, all right, let me jump in quick with um, Blue. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, because our staff there have been uh, sharing out plans for the Just Twos, the Just Threes, and the Just Fours uh, over these past couple of weeks. And uh, it's important in this age group that we're really limiting their screen time, as all of our pediatricians and, and research would tell us. We, we want to be really mindful of, of how much time our youngest um, very early learners are, are engaged in that way. And so um, Mrs. Greg Lack, who's the supervisor of Bloomin' Kids and I are in contact regularly in terms of the progress that particularly our four-year-olds are making with those plans. We're working through some of the engagements that staff will have with families and making sure that that remains really age appropriate um, at this time. Hi, this is Margaret. I can jump in about Bowers as well. Um, Bowers is, Aileen's been working really closely with the high school administrators. Um, we're we're going to work collaboratively, co collaboratively with the BHHS administrators to build out that plan for Bowers. So whatever, like the things that are happening at the high school are also happening at Bowers. And then this is Jennifer. I can address Wing Lake. Um, the Wing Lake staff are following the same protocols and templates as we're asking all of the other staff in the district to do. Um, they will be supporting students in a variety of ways, both through online virtual instruction um, and or packets as needed. Um, we're working with all of the staff there to um, they're, they've been taking equipment to families as is feasible for us to do so and reasonable for us to do so, so that they're able to access some of their adaptive um, devices for communication purposes and working with the parents um, on developing um, what their day and supports will look like as well. Uh, and I, I'll jump in on the para piece as well. Um, and Kelly, feel free to jump in too. Uh, right now, we're just in the very early stages of trying to determine what supports from them might look like. Um, we need to get the classroom teachers up and running and getting their programs um, off to a good start. And we're going to look for different ways that we're able to utilize the paras to support students and teachers. Thank you very much. Before we go back to Mark, um, uh, actually, before we go back to David to do his technology presentation, Mark, I don't know if his technology. Okay, David, you want to do your uh, technology presentation? Yeah, I'm sorry, Mark. We're having trouble with him, and and I got uh, a couple of my guys, Sean and Corey, trying to make sure he's on. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. This is technology. It's fine. It's Mark. I'm so sorry. We're gonna get you in. I'm gonna find a way to get you in. <laughs> All right. Um, but let me uh, let me get get here. So sorry. Okay, real briefly, um, is everybody able to see my screen okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. So just, just in general, I have one slide, but I wanted to provide you a, a couple of things. Uh, the challenge of you know retooling the district in roughly a couple of weeks is enormous. And if you think about our teachers who have been, you know, we've been in this particular paradigm and now we've got to shift it and move this way. And a lot of people I, I've heard from some community members and other things that, oh, this is easy, right? They're just going online. We're going to just have a, you know, WebEx and they'll do it all day long. 
And that's just not necessarily appropriate. And I think it's important to understand this. When we talk about education, and we particularly when we talk about technology and integration, there's two things that are going on here. We have built uh, virtual meeting tools like Zoom, WebEx, Google Meets, it's Teams, et cetera. Those were designed, and when we look at long distance learning, those were designed around andragogy, adult learning theory and practice. And we have our K-12 schools that have um, focused and built around pedagogy, right? This learning and practice for that particular age group. And when we look at those all distance learning platforms, et cetera, those were all designed around that adult learning. And we immediately have just copied and pasted that and pushed that into that K-12 space. And we know uh, our practice professionals and LST can, you know, I'm, I'm talking a little bit out of my lane, but LST can talk about this in deep, you know, much deeper, greater length that that's not necessarily appropriate. So we have a lot of challenges trying to help all of our students in all grade levels work on these uh, virtual platforms. However, even with all of those challenges, all this different things we got to do, the substitution and change, et cetera, I just want to say how proud I am of our teachers and staff. We, our, our IT team, about 12 hours prior to closing school, made sure the entire district could virtually meet. And that was between students, between staff, and between teachers. And that's huge. And so I've, I've got on the slide here just the Hangouts, the over 13,000 meets in those days, over 51,000 participants, and we've been averaging 29 minutes in duration. That's enormous. And that says a lot about our teachers and being able to immediately jump in and move forward. And, and let me say this too, our teachers are still in the driver's seat and in, it doesn't feel that right now. We're all trying to figure out, I mean, this car is like really weirdly, or as I think many of the team members have said, we're building an airplane as we fly it. And that's, that's challenging, but I do think it's important to understand even with kind of our curriculum, curriculum alignment, these, these frameworks are trying to build out the structure. Our teachers will be the driver of this. They'll be able to drive their, their instruction what tools they want to use. I just want you to understand that our district shared values around using just using digital tools is to try to use the tool as best for you. And we try to build the environment and supports to help you engage and do that. It's not always perfect. And we're in a bit of a crisis and a, a quick time around. So we had to reduce some of that flexibility to get launched, but we know we're going to be able to build out that capacity. We'll be able to build that ecosystem and the support to make sure that we can still beat those IT shared values. All right, so I, I kind of rambled on, but let me jump into delivered devices. And there was a number of questions about how we're delivering devices or how many we've done. We have delivered over 700 devices. Uh, we've been, we originally had some face-to-face -face interactions, but our team closing buildings on and on, we didn't think that was the appropriate way to move forward. And then since then we have been working on shipping and delivering devices directly to people's households. And we have a email that people are putting into that and we'll be able to track it and, and then we're engaging those families directly. So how are we gonna kind of do this moving forward? We are expanding our service desk. As Pat kind of alluded to, uh, we, we are going to add staff members. We're using both internal uh, staff members and then we're also probably bringing on some outside uh, help to expand and provide a better service. First and foremost, we're gonna have two basic lines of service. One will be for families uh, directly, another one will be for staff, and we will also have wing it, weekend support for both. And that we'll, we'll be rolling out what those timelines are. You know, We have to staff it and, and we have to move forward, but we'll be sharing that in the coming uh, days and as we get into next week as well. We'll also be expanding our tech integration support for staff. Obviously we are changing this dramatically and we need to have that. And the great thing is uh, Pat and cabinet leadership, we've we known for quite a few years and I, I know Cynthia and Mark were part of our original uh, tech assessment in 2012. And we talked about tech integration and we looked at a variety of models. We're now engaging that work where we, we're moving, uh, reworking and reorganizing our team to focus on that type of uh, support directly. So as Mark's having this problem right now, and again, I'm really sorry, Mark, but this is tech, right? And you think about it as I'm the teacher and I'm trying to have all of my students, how can I get this help? Well, the great thing is we're going to have a, our hotline. It's a 1-800 number. It goes to Paul Cole and he's going to answer it <laughs> and he's going to text me. No, but he, you'll be able to call in and we're going to be able to jump into your Google Meet and say, yeah, I'm seeing that problem. And then I can reach out to the family if I need to, or I can help start to manage it. 
So we want to make sure that our, our teachers are feeling comfortable enough that we've got the IT team jumping in to help them as they're moving along. Because we're all on the same journey together. So we'll, we're going to learn as we go along. Um, the, the other thing, too, is we're trying to reconfigure all of our infrastructure and workflows. Uh, both our inputs and outputs. And, and that's dramatic. Um, you're going to, in our next board meeting, we're going to be presenting a, a couple of different things of increasing our storage on our data center. We talked a little bit about that uh, previously. It's also going to help us, we think, to explore a private cloud. Uh, for example, right now we have teachers who are traveling teachers or others that are on laptops. They have direct access in. Our other teachers who have Chromebooks cannot get the same access to um, local stored or secured files on our network. We're going to expand. That's just one example. We're just trying to find all of those, those challenges we're seeing. And we've got a long list of challenges ahead of us, but we're each little by little prioritizing, okay, we can hit this, we can hit this, and now we're gonna be able to put some additional people on it. And I also appreciate the board support around what uh, our cost structures and the things that we need to prioritize. So I just wanna say thank you for that. And we will be moving forward with a variety of those things in the coming week. I hope that, so now I'm willing to take some questions, but I just wanted to share those things. Yeah, Dave, I don't, I'm, I don't think any of my colleagues have any questions, at least not in the chat room. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, pass it on to Pat, who's just gonna talk uh, briefly about our survey process. Um, as we move forward to try to enhance 2.0. Sure. So we're looking at surveying three different groups. The groups are going to be students. The group, group, uh, second group is going to be staff, um, and then our parents as well. And there will be four people that are directly involved. There will be more than that overall, but four directly involved. It will be Shira. It will be Lisa Efros. Jennifer Cook, and then Phil Liberatore from the union to make sure that we can kind of capture the essence. The idea is to have five or six really snapshot questions and then an open-ended box at the end so people can share their narrative that they'd like to share. And then that will help drive the work we're going to do. And then with my teacher task force, we'll be able to look at that and see if that really matches what they're seeing K through 12 as they're teaching these lessons and they're getting direct feedback from parents as well. And to give you an example of how we need to be more nimble, earlier this week, we advised um, our K through eight teachers, they really shouldn't use Zoom because some of the issues that were going on with people getting into the rooms that they have to link. Zoom made an update as far as their privacy settings to make it so you couldn't get in until you were invited into the room. Um, as soon as that was updated, we were able to pivot and tell our teachers that, you know, hey, it's okay. And we had also shared there's FERPA concerns. Kelly was able to find out that through MyStar and some of the work that Sandra had done, we actually were for compliance with that and to cross-check that. So these are things that in a typical school day, a typical school year, it might take a week or two weeks to get done. We were able to get done in two hours. And that's the kind of quickness that we want to be able to pivot with, not necessarily two hours, but it might be it's a Monday. We did a couple of different things. We need to pivot a little differently and do things differently. All right, Tuesday or Wednesday, let's make the adjustment. Let's move on. And then I is Mark, we're trying to get Mark on as well. I think um, just, you know, I mean, while we wait um, for Mark, actually Mark did, you know, I, I reached out to him. I mean, I asked him if he had any questions, so I'll just say he said he's good. Most of our questions were covered by his colleagues. He just wanted to convey his thanks to everybody for that flexibi flexibility and humanity. So, it, so that was kind of what his message would have been. All of his questions that he would have had um, were previously asked. Um, with that, I know, Howard, you had a, a question for David. Do you want to ask a question for David? Yes, uh, David, quick question. Um, with the coronavirus um, uh, crisis we've got, uh, Comcast has uh, uh, altered their Internet Essentials program, whereby it's free uh, for people who um, who qualify. Do you know whether anyone, and I know we've put that in some of our uh, our broadcasts, do you know whether uh, uh, any parents have taken advantage of that program? Yeah, I, I do not, and, and I'm not aware that Comcast shares that. They've never shared that previously. So we, uh, yeah, so I do not know. Well, okay, because uh, I can share, I can send you the link to it, uh, because I think that uh, in, if you're saying it's difficult to get hotspots um, through the, no, no, no. So, this is one way for people to get the LinkedIn. 
Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, completely. I just don't, we don't have data. Comcast doesn't share that data in terms of who uses uh, Comcast Essentials. Is okay. what I'm referring to. But yes, and, we yeah. we do uh, promote that. We've had a number of conversations. I've had um, a number. I've had three conversations in the last week regards to helping families navigate those waters to make sure that they can, you know, contact Comcast, et cetera, and get that. Last week, uh, we had helped one family get their Comcast going as well. If memory serves, the way they can qualify for the program, they have to uh, give a form to the district to show that they're free and reduced. So uh, we should have some sort of a mechanism to, to understand how many people actually using it. Uh, actually, well, we're applying for it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and while David puts up um, the public comment, which I will read, just keep in mind for public comment, it's just dialogue to the board. We're not going to be able at this meeting right now answer it, but somebody, if not myself or Pat or a member of his team, will be getting back to each and every one of you who has submitted a public comment. So I will read them now, and they're on the screen one at a time. Uh, Charles Howard, um, his public comment was, what does the executive order mean for school credits and final grades? Will our classes be on a pass-fail basis? And what does that do to our GPA? Christine Pitcol from BHMS. Is the district considering starting school day to school prior to Labor Day as allowed by the state of Michigan to allow for gap learning for the previous school year? Nicole Swakowski from Conant. Thank you for all your efforts. This is a time when we need patience, a place to alleviate unnecessary frustration for parents with multiple children will be the, the use of common online tools. Class Dojo, Seesaw, Zoom, Google Chat, class websites, and countless others are in use today. Is there a plan to streamline this to baseline communication tools? Christine Pitcole from BHMS, overwhelmed by implementation as with a two-person working family, what are your suggestions for families that cannot be full-time teachers for our less independent elementary learners? Renew, renew um, Zertowski um, from BHMS, sincerely thank you. I'm confident that the district have been working feverishly on home learning for our students early on. I am so pleased that, that my confidence has been validated. We are fortunate, we are patient, we are together, thank you. Lisa Finney from BHMS and BHHS, Will teachers be coordinating Zoom calls times collectively to, dis to decrease overlap? Right now, there are scheduling conflicts which causes students to miss virtual meetings. Amit from BHMS, uh, the school district board educators administrators is doing a great job to progress learning for all of our children these trying times. Thank you for all your efforts in developing this program. Jeanette Sal, BHHS, Will two weeks of work be given out at the beginning of the of the two weeks? How are grades in high schools going to work? Amy Benson, BHHS. So you are rolling out Remind, another place for parents to go. Will we be required to use all the various other platforms such as Canvas, My Bloomfield, and Google Classroom, or will everything be easy to find in one place? Are teachers all being required to use Google Classroom only? Denise Ullum, BHMS, BHHS. Thank you all for your effort, time, compassion, and hours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are wondering if our students will continue to have some instructional teams that they had before the switch to online learning. I apologize if you covered this and I missed the info. Best wishes to anyone. Uh, Shannon Kirkview, East Hills, fourth grade and BHHS, 10th grade. What is your opinion? How much this plan can accomplish to have the children prepared for the next grade level and or will there be a review in the fall? Will parents still have teacher conferences to discuss fall placement? Christine, Christina Kane, BH, BHMS. Have the logistics been worked out yet for students to be able to pick up their belongings from their classrooms and lockers? Chris Decker, East Hills. Did you say parents will not receive an email until Monday, 413? How do we prepare our students for the new schedule? Why not send it out next week so they have time to look at it over with our kids? Terry Barde, Conant. Thank you for your efforts to undertake e-learning. My biggest concern at this point is not having the schedule until the morning that the program is starting. Both myself and my husband are working, as I assume applies to many families in the district. So not receiving the materials prior sets up kids to start off behind. It seems that sending out materials and then beginning a day or two later would be more reasonable. Kim Costas, Eastover and East Hills, many struggling students have already experienced the summer slide. 
if and when the situation stabilizes, a district with robust resources like BHS should provide in-person extended school year-like services to all special education and at-risk learners. The 3.0 plan or whatever fancy tag you want to give it must include a bridge from online school to the traditional classroom. Please consider some learning opportunities and seek input from students and parents. Michelle Gilbert, Michelle Gilbert, BHMS, BHHS. I know it's early, but are you considering sending kids back in August for additional catch-up times? So not to push much strain on kids learning, one, one and a third in one year, assuming things are relatively back to normal. Denise Ullum, BHMS, BHHS, what exactly, who exactly should a family reach out to if there was a crisis? What is the protocol? Uh, Kathy Denisher, um, BHHS, is there a possibility for senior student recognition such as concerto concert being held later in the summer? Ashwani Parte, BHMS, will it be too overwhelming for the teacher to have a virtual class for the fifth, sixth graders at all once? It is a different scenario when they're when they are in person while conducting this online is difficult, much easier with older kids. Are they planning to have small group sessions to keep focus and attention? Uh, okay, Mary Spiegel, BHHS. What is going to happen with regards to prom, senior awards, graduation? Ashwani, Parthe, BHMS. In the anticipation of school starting after a few weeks, we did not pick up all the things from school. Are we allowed to get the rest of the stuff? Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, does any of my colleagues have any additional questions? I don't see anything in the chat room. Paul, yeah, Paul, it would be wonderful if we can take the responses to the public comments and put them on that same spreadsheet so they're available to the public and to the board when we do get to them over the next few days. Okay. Any other questions from any or questions or comments from any of my colleagues? With that, I will. Um, Pat, do you have anything else to say? No, just okay. thank you. With that, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and we'll be having our regular board meetings as scheduled, and the meetings and times will be posted. With that, I will call the meeting to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you.